typically I'm on Saturdays at one o'clock, you know, uh, on the four agreements. And he's doing one, he's doing a program this Saturday at one o'clock if you're interested. The Zoom numbers for that are on our website. You can check them out if you want to. Okay, he's been doing a lot of good workshops for us there. They're pretty neat. I also want to mention, mention the fact that at, when we finish this series in the next two weeks after today, okay, then basically I'll be starting a new series. I'll be doing the 12 steps on self-parenting. I'm going to talk about self-parenting tonight, and basically I'll be doing it in much more detail as I take you through the 12 steps based on self-parenting. Okay, so the, uh, it's, it's a new series that we're doing. You can check that out, okay? The schedule, the schedule is on the website. Okay, I'm gonna begin by doing a, a reading from a book called For Today. It's my, one of my meditation books for my Overeaters Anonymous program. It's from July 26th. The comforts of material possessions do not make up for emotional and spiritual impoverishment. Being a product of this society, I tell myself that if I had this and that, I would feel better. So I get this and that. I find that my purchasing power does not indeed seem to reduce anxiety, but not for long. No matter what I do, there's only a distraction. And I return again and again to myself. When I am close to my higher power and the people I love, I am not aware of the car I drive, the house I live in. I am not fighting temptation, nor am I wanting and wishing. I am neither afraid nor overconfident. When I am busy cultivating loving relationships, I can easily do without a surprising number of things. Maybe. <clears throat> I, I kind of wanted to share that because we're going to talk a lot tonight getting a little deeper into the recovery process, we talk a lot about the concept of affirmations and self-parenting. But I want to backtrack to where I left off the end of last week. If you remember, I, I asked you about something called the fantasy family. I'm going to kind of kick it off with that. The reason why I asked you to write the fantasy family is because as we now get into a little bit of the time doing inner child work, we have to realize that in order to get out of our head, we have to get into our child because inside of each and every one of us, there's an adult and a child. But children basically have an imagination. They can open up doors. Most of us as codependents have a hard time with that. So in writing a fantasy family, what you're actually doing is you're making believe you're getting ready to be born. You're going to create on paper the perfect family to you to live in. Now, many of us as codependents and adult children get nervous about that because we feel like we're being disloyal to our real family. Put your real family on the back burner for a couple of minutes and just concentrate on <clears throat> giving yourself permission to use your imagination and go into your fantasy. In doing so, you don't realize it, but you're actually identifying your needs. Give an example for myself. One of the things when I looked at this concept of the perfect mother I always wanted a mother that would give me space, give me distance, and allow me just to be myself. I didn't have that as a child. But I realized today I want to be, I want to be around people that will give me space and allow me to have a life of my own. I don't want to be around people that are going to try to control me and run my life for me. I have a sense of being able to have a sense of my own life. My father was a beautiful man, wonderful man. The only problem was he came from the old country and didn't know a lot about American culture. And so basically when I was a kid, I never really had the opportunity to do some of the things I always wanted to do. So I kind of relied on what I call a surrogate dad. And my uncle was one of my surrogate dads. So I used a surrogate program. What I'm learning, if you get your needs met in one area, then you go someplace else and get them met. My uncle was a great source for me of getting my needs met, kind of a father figure. In fact, just as an aside, I'll tell you a story. He took me when I was 10 years old to see the Phillies and the Yankees in the World Series in 1950. I went to the third game of the World Series. Never been to a World Series game in my life before. It was very powerful. I got to see Vic Rashi and Robin Roberts pitch. 
And I got to see the manager hit a home run in the 10th inning to win the game. I'll never forget that. So it's etched in my mind. And yet that never would have happened with my real dad, but my uncle was able to do some of the things my real dad couldn't do. That's not putting my real dad down. He wasn't capable of doing them. I think we have to learn this. We have to learn to get our needs met, to identify our needs, to get them met from people that are open to participate in them with us and not basically to try to get people to meet our needs who are not available to meet our needs. See, in a fantasy family, you actually start identifying some of your needs. But I've learned to use the program called the surrogate program to go and let, let people be for you what you never had. To be around people you feel safe and you feel comfortable with to get your needs met. And so we have to be able to build these people into our life because they fundamentally are then people we can kind of work with and be connected to. And I learned this so many times on my own journey in my own life because I realized I used to spend a lot of time waiting for something else to happen. For example, I spent years blaming a lot of people. I was unhappy because of you. My life is miserable because of you. So I used to blame my family. I used to blame the church. I used to blame all kinds of people. My therapist used to say to me, stop it. Look within your own self. These are your issues. You get your needs met from people that are open to meet them with you and not keep trying to change people to meet your needs. And so the fantasy family helped me to understand that. One of my great fantasies is I would live in a place, you know, that's very peaceful and very serene. Growing up as a kid, I grew up in what I refer to today as the Italian compound. And we had people in our house, God only knows who they were. And I asked my father, I say, who's that, dad? That's your guma. Who's that? That's your guma. I must have had 200 gumas and 200 gumas. I had no idea who they were. But basically, the crazy part about it was they were in and out of our house. So it was like Grand Central Station. There was never a sense of serenity a calmness or peacefulness in our house. There was always something crazy going on. And, and sometimes it was a lot of fun, but there never was a sense of just be able to be yourself. I'm grateful today I have places I can go, places I can be, where I can have a sense of serenity and peace. So what I learned in the fantasy family, it's, it's okay to be able to do that. And I'll give you a good example of what I, when I talk about the fantasy concept. Quite a number of years ago, a young couple came to see me. They were from Narcotics Anonymous. And they came to see me because I was working with them, getting them ready for their wedding. I was going to perform their wedding. And basically, they came to see me, and they were very upset. They said, our parents are driving us crazy. We don't want alcohol at our wedding. They want alcohol at the wedding. They're convinced, and that, and everything else, going back and forth. It's like our house is turning into a big fight. So I do this as I do with a lot of people. I say, look, take this yellow pad, go in the other room. What I want you to do is forget your families. I want you to create on paper what you would consider to be your fantasy wedding. Just do it. Create the perfect wedding you would like to have, just the two of you together. About 45 minutes later, they came back. They brought the pad and they showed it to me. When I read it, I said, that's your wedding. It was a beautiful, it was a beautiful wedding. Basically, what they did is not the traditional stuff. We used the philosophy of the program for their wedding vows and ceremony. And then for the reception, instead of going through all the traditional stuff, the two of them shared their re recovery stories with their family. The family thought it was wonderful. There was no alcohol. It was a powerful and beautiful wedding. And they got to be able to share the gift of who they were with their family, which is very powerful for them as well as for everybody else. So this system works. Sometimes it's good for us when we get caught in something. Step back. Use the fantasy concept. Use the concept of learning things for yourself as a person. Along with that goes the concept of affirmations. I'm talking about affirmations because here's the most important point 
we're going to be talking about in the recovery process from codependency. We have to learn before we actually do our family of origin work. We have to learn how to look at things through positive eyes. See, recovery is not about finding out what's wrong. Recovery is about being able to discover what happened, embrace it, learn from it, grow from it, and be able to learn positive lessons from it. And later on, I talk about self-parenting. I'll show you how this works. But the concept is we have to learn something, which is really important. But all of us went through stuff in the course of our journey in life. Now, I can spend my entire life beating myself up and looking at it negatively and getting all caught up in expectations. But because so many of us in growing up were given negative messages. Those messages stick with us, especially in those early years. Now, the affirmation process is a way to restructure yourself, or I use the term, re-brainwash yourself to think positively. For example, I gave you an exercise last week. The exercise is very simple. Every night for you at a bed, stand in front of a mirror. It's called mirror therapy. And just say to yourself, you're special, you're beautiful, and I love you. And I told you you can kiss yourself goodnight too if you want to. But the beautiful part about it is if you do that on a regular basis, it will stick with you. Affirmations work if you do them on a regular basis. I told you to ask two people that you really feel comfortable with to write you a letter telling you everything they like about you. All the positive things they like about you, nothing negative. Then I asked you to write yourself a love letter telling yourself all the things you like about yourself as a person. And what I learned is if you can take the, the, all that information and stuff that I gave you and be able to do affirmations, for example, take 10 words, you can pick them yourself and work on I statements. I am special. I am beautiful. I am loved. I am capable of doing so many beautiful things. I am a very positive and beautiful person. All these I statements they're called affirmations. And if you're just able to write them down and begin to use them and connect them together. Now, one of the traditions we tell people to do is take your phone, or whatever instrument you might have, an iPod, whatever it happens to be, and make a recording. Read the fantasy family into your phone. Read the letters from other people into your phone. Read a love letter you wrote to yourself into your phone. And then if you're written affirmations, right, put them on your phone. What you're actually doing is you're creating an affirmation recording. Then we tell you, play that every day for 30 days because it's your voice reading and saying these things to you. If you want to really have them sink in, play them at night while you're sleeping. On one of those auto-reverse recorders. Because what you're doing is you're basically over and over again hearing stuff. And when you're asleep, you pick up stuff even better. There are also things called as subliminal affirmations. And again, this is an old custom that goes back, actually it's an illegal custom, that went back to the 50s. Back in the 50s, you went into a supermarket. And in a supermarket, you over the loudspeaker, they kept saying, Buy blopto chewing gum, buy blopto chewing gum, buy blopto chewing gum. You come to the counter, you got blopto chewing gum. You don't know how you got it. You don't even know what it is, but you bought it. You were programmed to buy it. Now, they can do this subliminally. For example, years ago, what they used to do on radio, and they used to also do it through music. They would play soft music while you were shopping. But underneath, they dubbed in different messages of things they'd like you to buy. They were literally brainwashing you to pick those things up. We took that concept and brought it into the recovery world. And we have what we call subliminal affirmations. There's CDs you can buy where basically you listen to nice, beautiful music as you're sleeping at night. But behind it are beautiful messages. You are special, you are beautiful, you are loved. All these things are being programmed into you as you're asleep. And they even work more powerfully when you're sleeping because your defenses are down when you're asleep.
actually. So there are many ways of doing affirmations, but the bottom line is we want you to be able to do these so you start to reprogram yourself to think positively. See, it's real simple. I don't ever want anybody to do family of origin work or inner child work unless they're willing to do it with a positive attitude. See, I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing wrong with anybody in this room. Whatever happened in your past happened. But they have to learn the process of being able to face it, deal with it, learn from it, and grow from it. Because your history is your most powerful teacher. That interconnects with the concept of self-parenting. In self-parenting, we learn three basic things. We learn to have a sense of faith or a higher power. We learn something called a higher parent. I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. We talk about the inner child. The higher parent is us. The higher parent is the adult who's going to learn to parent the child. See, inside of each and every one of us, there's an adult and there's a child. The adult personality in us is the part of us that is logical, that is able to handle situations, that can sort things out, has a sense of maturity, and can deal with things in life. The child in us is our spontaneous part. It's our fun-loving part. It's a kid we have inside of ourselves. And to be a truly healthy person, we need to be able to have a combination of both. So the higher parent, as they call it in the self-parenting circles, or the adult, has to learn how to parent the child. But how do we do that? First of all, we have to learn how to give the child a voice. And so the, the higher parent allows the little child to express its feelings, to get in touch with its feelings. Then the higher parent talks to that little child and helps that little child to sort things out. They'll look at what positive lessons they can learn from it. See, whatever happened in your life, no matter what it is, there's a positive side to everything. So we have to learn how to be able to put ourselves in touch with that side of ourselves, which is a very important piece of who we are as individuals and people. And yet it's hard sometimes to do that because we're not used to it. So many of us have a tendency not to listen to the child inside of us because the child is the energy of love that we have inside of us. There's the power of healing we have inside of us. That little child, has been there from the beginning. That little child was given to us by God for the energy of love. And that little child is a part of us that teaches us to look at life through a different set of eyes. And yet we need the higher parent to help us to sort things out. That goes back to what I talked about earlier in the surrogate process and finding people in your life that you feel comfortable with, you feel safe with, people that will accept you, people I can share myself with, and people that I can share myself with safety and feel comfortable. And not to get advice or anything, just to process what's going on inside of me. You know, one of the great experiences I've had, and I'm grateful for it today, I was able to write my second book. My second book is called Learn to Value Your Childhood Because Your History Is Your Teacher. I love that book where I put it together because I've learned something in my life today. My childhood, my family, the things I went through were all gifts that were given to me by God. Were they dysfunctional? Yes. They won awards, believe me. They had their forms of dysfunctionality. But at the same time, if I'm able to finally come to a point instead of blaming and being angry at them, and spending my life being angry at them. I'm learning to look at them through a different set of eyes. And so the higher parent in me, or the adult, allows the inner child to embrace its history, to accept it, to process it and learn from it. And as a result then, the higher parent, or the adult in me, helps that little child to sort it out, 
to find good positive things they can learn from that. I look at my mom today, you know, a lot differently. I looked at I looked at her years ago. I spent a lot of time in my life being very angry at my mother. Because again, I constantly felt like I was overpowered by her. But today I see it differently. My mom was who she was. And today I realize the fact that she was one of my teachers. My mom, with all of her dysfunctional ways, gave me some wonderful gifts. She gave me my addictive personality. And believe it or not, I'm grateful today has given me the gift of being connected to recovery. Without that gift, I don't know where I'd be today. So I'm grateful to her. She also taught me a lot of survivor skills, how to be able to handle situations. You know, I know now because of my mom, I was able to get through situations in my life I thought I'd never get through. But I learned, don't be afraid, even though fear was a big part of my life for a long period of time. My higher parent, the adult in me, helped my little child to overcome its fears and to be able to handle things I could never handle before. My father, the exact same thing. I love my dad. He's a great guy. But again, basically, my dad never had a life. He was teaching me constantly that we want people to love you, do everything for them. He taught me to be a victim. And believe me, I picked up his patterns. Everybody took, took advantage of my dad. My dad was there for everybody. He held the family together. He was the one everybody depended on. He always came through for everybody. That became me. And the scary part about it was I had to ask my higher parent or the more mature adult as I got deeper into recovery. To look back at that little child and say, look, your dad was a good man. He was a teacher. But you have to learn something from your dad. It's okay for you to take care of yourself today, even though your dad did not know how to do that. I had to realize the fact that, yes, I was angry at him. Because he didn't teach me some of the basic things, but I was angry at a lot of different places because I was taught all my life to do everything for everybody else. Then people will like you. Whenever I really began to set some boundaries and learn that scary word to all codependents, no. I still have a hard time with it today. I still go through changes with it today. But the bottom line is I'm getting better at it a little bit at a time. And I'm learning more and more how to be able to ask for my needs. You know, we learn in the concept of self-parenting the importance of asking for our needs. We learn over a period of time how to be able to allow that little girl, a little boy that's deep down inside of you to be able to heal, to forgive, to work through forgiveness. But that little child can't do that by itself. It needs deep down inside a guide, someone to help it, to guide it. And that's why in self-parenting, we have to learn to get our needs met in a positive way. Now, I'm grateful today to a lot of people in my life who've helped me to basically find stuff in my life. I, I mean, I can't believe I'm doing half the things I'm doing today that I never could have done before because I was stuck in fear. I was stuck in guilt. I was stuck in worry. I realized today that life is a lot calmer, a lot more peaceful today, and I'm grateful. And I'm grateful for the people that I call them my higher parents sometimes that allow me to be a child. I'm allowed to play. I'm allowed to have fun. It's a time and a place for everything. So my higher parent teaches me when and where. For example, if you're a job and you wake up in the morning, the alarm goes off, the little child in you says, ah, stay home, go play, have a good time, the hell with the job. The little child just wants to be spontaneous and run. And the adult or the higher parent says, I hear you. I know you want to play, but for now, we have to put it on the back burner, and when I get home from work today, we'll go play. The higher parent helps us to be able to look at things in a more positive way so that we can also enjoy the child, but also enjoy our responsibility too. It's that balance that we're talking about all the time. 
So we have to be able to continuously do in the course of our journey in life. And so we're constantly learning how to parent different parts of ourselves as individuals. We're learning how to parent that child. Otherwise, we just can't do whatever we feel like doing whenever we feel like doing it. So a part of me has to have a sense of responsibility. At the same time, I don't want to have to diminish the feelings of that little child. It just wants to be able to let loose, let their hair down. I think I must have let down, but to let their hair down, to have fun, to celebrate, to enjoy. But again, remember, everything in life has a time and has a place. I love that concept. You know, there's a time to pray. There's a time to mourn. Time to celebrate. There's a time for everything in life. And that's where balance comes into play. And that's why these two people in parenting have to work together. It's almost like we have these two little personalities inside of us. There's my adult and there's my child. They have to learn to listen to each other, help each other, and bring a little sense of balance to each other. Because all, many of us have what I call a hurt child. You may have gone through some major trauma, a lot of pain, a lot of struggling in your life. And a lot of stuff you may have blocked out. You don't want to deal with it. You don't want to see it because you're scared. And the easiest way to deal with it is just simply say, oh, forget about it. It's not there. But it's there. It does have an effect on you, an effect on your body, an effect on your life. Louise Hay used to say this a long time ago, that unresolved anger, unresolved frustration, unresolved stuff can actually create disease in your body. And she used to teach people this in her process to realize the fact that so many times our body is not stupid. If our emotional system is messed up, then our body responds accordingly. And that's why you find yourself overtired sometimes because you can't handle situations. And yet, so many of us don't have a tendency to sit down and relax, take it easy. The child says, relax. The adult says, let's go relax. The child, no, no, let's keep going. Let's play. Let's have some fun. The adult says, calm down. Take it easy. We'll do that when it's time to do it. There's always that balance. Someone like having a, I use the term, there's a, there's a discussion going on inside of yourself. That's why I love the self-parenting concept. I call it the individual discussion. We've got the adult and the child talking to each other, sharing with each other. And I have to be able to acknowledge that child, give myself permission to be a child. That's why there's a time to color in your coloring book. There's a time just to laugh and have a good time. There's a time to be serious. There's a time to know what to do and where to do and how to do it. And even there are situations you're going to find yourself in where maybe you do want to just scream and laugh when you see something going on, but your adult says, not now. Not the time or place to do it. There's that balance, constant balance. And that's what self-parenting really is all about. It's about helping to overcome our fears. When we get into the 12 steps on self-parenting, we'll get into the concept of learning about them. Just to give an example in step one. The first step in self-parenting, the steps are admit our powerlessness to change our past. Our, that our lives have become unmanageable, Came one to surrender to our love and not to our fear. I love that first step, you know, to admit our powerlessness over our past. But to, to basically be willing to surrender to our love and not to our fear. Although the fear is real, we have to be able to temper the fear with a sense of love. And so the steps in self-parenting will teach us the techniques and the ways of being able to do this. And they'll give us the background of how to do it. But again, we have to have that balance. But to do that, we also have to have affirmations. We have to affirm ourselves in a positive way. Begin to reprogram ourselves to think positive. There's a beautiful person inside of each and every one of us. We have to acknowledge that person. And we have to fight those old tapes, those old things inside of us those old negative messages, and realize we can create new messages. And that's what the higher parent does. The higher parent helps you create new messages along with the higher power. 
So we have those three components functioning inside of us, a higher power, our sense of faith, our belief in something more powerful than us. We have our higher parent, who literally is the adult in us, who is trying to help keep things balanced and under control, and trying to keep things within boundaries. There's a child in us, which is the playful part of us, the fun part of us. And we have to be able to sometimes bring the two of them together and be able to, the child helps the adult to laugh more and the adult helps the child to calm down more. So we have a balance between two. That's why I always say sometimes opposites attract because they bring the goodness to each side of things in life. You want things always to be the same. There has to be that constant give and take and that back and forth that goes along with it. And so when we talk about self-parenting, we go through the steps of self-parenting. We'll take you through the concept of learning how to move away from control, move away from fear, develop the energy and the power of love. And that's really what doing your family of origin work really is all about. So I'm gonna share something with you, which is really important. I put together nine questions. I mean, I'm sorry, not nine, seven questions. And these are questions that for you to get a copy of them, go to our website, go to Vince's Corner, and scroll down to the bottom where it says codependent series, under it are listed the seven questions. And these are the questions we work on getting ready to do family of origin work. And I'll go through them real quickly. It's about perception. I'm really gonna emphasize that. I talked to a lady today who has six children. She asked me a question. In what way have I hurt my children as they're growing up in the early years? I said, relax. I can take all six of her children, put them in six separate rooms, do a family history with every child and come out with, with six different families. It's amazing, isn't it? It's about perception. It's not about things that have happened. All of our children perceive us differently. When your children go to therapy, what are they going to talk about? They're going to talk about you. Talk about their mom, their dad, their home, their environment, stuff to this effect. So without asking anybody else, do a little inventory of your own family of origin work that these questions are. What's your perception of your parents? We're looking back now on the first 10 years of your life from zero to 10. What was your perception of your parents, of your, of your grandparents? What, what was the perception of the environment you grew up in those early 10 years, the culture or the environment? What's your perception of religious upbringing back then? How did it affect you in the course of your journey in life? What's your, your perception of your, your peers you grew up with? How do they have an effect on you and your journey? What's your perception of yourself as a child? And finally, how did your childhood traits and characteristics affect your relationships in life? How do they affect our relationships? And so we realize over and over again that so many times we attract people into our life out of need. Sometimes things that come from our childhood come right into our relationship stuff. So it's a big part of it. There's a positives and negative to everything in life. It's the secret to the thing. So to get a copy of the questions, go to the website and you can go to Vince's Corner, scroll down to it. And if you're down to the end of Vince's Corner where everything's listed, you'll see codependency series where the, seat, where the recordings are. Under it are the seven questions. You can download a copy of them and take a look at them. And again, I want to emphasize something. This is stuff that we're going to work on next week, but for family of origin work. Don't think you have to get it done. If you want to work on some of it, fine. But you don't have to have it done to come here. I'm teaching you a process tonight. And the process is exactly that. It's a process. It's not a magical event. And so I'm giving you the different concepts and techniques and ways, but there's a lot more to it. You have to learn the process, which is important. And so I can give you techniques and ways to do some of this stuff, but I recommend doing it in conjunction with other individuals and people. Don't do it by yourself. We need to have people we can kick stuff off of to help us through this process with a therapist or a counselor or somebody to help you through it. It's a guideline you can follow. 
But these are all things that are just simply that, the ways in which you can begin to do some of this stuff for yourself, to look at your own history and look at your own background. What helped me tremendously in doing a lot of this was to go back and look at my parents' history. You know, my parents' history, you know, they went through a lot. And I understand a lot of things today by being able to go through their history. And so don't be afraid of history. Because I really believe your history is your teacher. We came through family systems. We came through environments. All those things are part of who we are. But now we need that higher parent, the higher power and the higher parent to help us to sort it all out and be able to learn good lessons from it and not to spend the rest of our life saying, I didn't get this, I didn't get that, I'm not happy, this, and no, don't get into that bag. This is about healing, forgiving, learning, growing, and moving forward. And so when we do family of origin work next week, we'll show you how to, we can process all this stuff based on your original family of origin. But we gotta do it with a positive attitude. And so we have to learn Identify our needs, get our needs met. Use the surrogate technique to get needs met from people that are healthy and not from people that are unhealthy. To learn deep down inside to do affirmations, to affirm yourself, change the tapes, affirm yourself in a positive way. And finally, to be able to allow that higher parent or the adult in us to parent the child in us. For deep, deep inside, we are little children of an adult body and an adult mind. Combine the two together, you've got somebody very special. You've got a fully alive person. Every one of us in this room, no matter who we are, if we have that combination, we have a sense of beauty inside of ourselves as a person. So your history is your teacher. Learn from it, grow from it. Don't run away from it. I have learned when I embrace it, I learn from it and I can see things more positively. So my parents, they're my guides and my teachers. My family are my guides and my teachers. Things I've gone through, they're all part of the journey. Now, do I still go through changes with that? Of course. But also have to realize the fact that we have to learn over and over again, the art of forgiveness and healing. And that's really what this really is all about. To break old patterns and develop a new sense of ourselves as people. And so, what I would like to do tonight as we say our prayers and connect together is say a special prayer based on what we just talked about tonight. So let us pray. God, we come before you as a family. We ask that for your guidance and your direction. You have given us so many gifts. Give us the gift of a little child inside of us. The little child will set you free. You have taught us over and over again not to be afraid of the beautiful energy of love that we have inside of ourselves. Help us to love who we are, to celebrate who we are. God, teach us to look at our history, to be able to learn from it and grow from it. Help us to forgive, to heal, to make peace, to learn from the things that we go through in life, to try to have a positive attitude in all the things that we do, to affirm ourselves in positive ways, we can do all this, God, with your help and your direction, for you are our higher self, our higher, our higher power. And along with the adult in us and the child in us, and with your guidance and your direction, we're able to do the things we need to do. We also pray in a special way tonight for those who have gone before us, for all those who are part of our family, for they too are our guides. And we learn lessons from each and every one of them that have touched our lives for they too have helped us on our journey. We're on a journey, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for being with us on that journey and walking alongside of us, knowing that we'll never be alone. But above all, teach us to ask for your help, your guidance and your direction, and you will give it to us. We pray and we ask for this guidance, this direction. We pray in a spirit of humility, a spirit of gratitude and a spirit of love. We pray this in your name. Amen. And now if you want to unmute yourself, we're going to say serenity prayer together. And I'm going to ask you God, 
Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. God's will, not mine, be done.